Um, and what is also good to know is that there is uh, interpretation available in the uh, languages of uh, French, Spanish, and uh, French, English, and Ukrainian. Uh, I think the French interpreter is still, uh, sorry, the Spanish interpreter is still to come. Um, so do send a message if you are in need of that. Um, they also will make themselves visible in the in the chat. Um, yes, and uh, then for the agenda, uh, it's quite a full agenda, but uh, I I think it is quite exciting um, because the main goal of today is of course to launch the Ecofeminist scorecard for the EU elections. Um, the EU elections are of course coming up uh, from the sixth to the 9th of June um, in all. EU countries. Um, and there are some uh, big national differences which we will go about uh, today. Um, and today we'll also be presenting the pan-European scorecard, which means that we have scored all the uh, European political groups uh, in order to make uh, life easier for EU citizens in, in order to find their way to the labyrinth of what the uh, European Union is. Super. Um, and then afterwards, uh, we will engage in a panel discussion with uh, three very interesting guests uh, that are uh, Devika Portiman from uh, Stem op een Vrouw in Dutch, but in English Vote for a Woman, um, a foundation that is aiming to increase uh, women representation or emancipation in uh, in political yeah in political groups, so to say. Uh, we have Ewald van Hoek. Um, he is with 19 years old, one of the youngest uh, people to be elected this year uh, for the European Parliament. And lastly, we have uh, Francesca Sabatini, a political activist and researcher from uh, Bologna, Italy. And uh, with them, I will engage a bit in, into a conversation about the European Union, the challenges that we are facing, uh, especially for the feminist movement, and also their views on that as they all come from very different perspectives. And afterwards, we will uh, go to the closing and also provide you with some material of, okay, and what now? How can I use this scorecard? Um, okay, uh, but first, we will be doing a small Mentimeter, uh, which I'll be sharing in one second. Uh, where is it now? Because um, I would also like to know uh, who is in the room and how we're feeling about these EU elections as uh, in some countries are already a bit more present, but not so much yet. Um, and if I'm correct, uh, you can now see my screen. Um, if you can't, please ask it in the chat. Uh, and there will pop up a small window uh, in the in your right corner that asks you to um, collaborate. Um, and it would be nice if you then collaborate because then you can uh, fill in the poll of how do you feel about EU elections? Are you really excited about EU elections? Are you trusting the, the community support that we have? Can't wait until the elections are over. Are you, are you actually quite scared uh, because the polls don't look very well uh, for, for left-wing or more progressive uh, yeah, parties? I'm, I'm very happy to see that most people still have the, the faith that together we'll be able to make it. But also some uh, some scared people. And, and that's also very understandable. Um, and that's also why that's uh, quite an important topic today of what are the challenges and what rights are actually under pressure um, within these uh, eco-feminist movements. Um, yeah. I think in, in almost every country now, it's a, it's a concern. Okay, and then I'll go to the next slide. And that's, where are you from? To also see um, what geographical scope we're covering today, because uh, yeah, we are, I hope that I put in all the, all the correct countries. Um, and I think I also put in the candidate countries. If not, I'm very sorry. Uh, but just to see uh, what are the, what are the national, nationalities that we're talking to today. I see France, Belgium, Netherlands, Italy. My country's on the list, I'm sorry. Uh, more Netherlands. Okay, still very quite Western European. Okay, 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 okay. And what is also good to know is that in the coming weeks, we'll be organizing more of these webinars um, to, uh, 
yeah, really try to build that that community effort towards the elections. That's from someone from Ireland. So, okay, and then I will again close off this Mentimeter. Um, and if uh, Yasha, if you could share the presentation again, then I will be uh, doing a short introduction still um, of the rest of uh, of today and why we actually decided to go forward with this scorecard. Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. Okay, so um, why did we decide to do a scorecard? Uh, what is good to know is that we already did this campaign also in 2019, and 2019 was quite a special year. Some of you uh, might notice already, but there was really a historic uh, voter turnout, uh, exceeding 50% of all eligible voters for the first time since 1990s. Uh, and what was very interesting about these elections was that the difference was mostly made by young voters. Um, and that's what we uh, aim to do again uh, this year, uh, which is why this year we wrote EU Elections Toolkit for Youth. The EU is a very interesting, but also very complex institution. Uh, and in this toolkit, we have tried to make this a little bit more comprehensible, a little bit more understandable. What institutions are there? What are the differences between, uh, for example, uh, the Council of Europe and the European Council? Um, like all these kind of stuff uh, we've tried to cover in the toolkit. And what was also really great about the toolkit is that uh, we designed a workshop in there, which was focused on engaging young people towards EU elections. So the past few months, we've been very busy with um, organizing workshops and all kinds of, or, well, not our countries, um, for example, in Spain, in France, in Germany, and Netherlands, uh, and together with young people that are interested in ecofeminism, we've uh, tried to score um, uh, the, um, the party manifestos. Um, okay, and I see if you, Pardon me for one second. I see that our interpreter, uh, our Spanish interpreter is here. And I'm just going to add them um, as interpreters so that also uh, people that would prefer to have Spanish interpretation um, can join in. And they can do that right now. So, OK, sorry. Um, yeah, so that's why we. Uh, this decided to uh, yeah join efforts again and work on this scorecard. Uh, leading to the moment of today, uh, we're releasing as well the pan-European scorecard, the Dutch scorecard, and the German scorecard. Although the focus of this webinar will be on the pan-European scorecard. Um, and for the toolkit, uh, this is also now available in Dutch, English, German, and Portuguese, and very soon also in Spanish. So if you are still working on the EU elections in the upcoming month, uh, you uh, are very welcome to uh, look into this material on our website. It's freely available. So please do make use of it. Now we'll go to the next slide. Yeah, because what we also are trying to do is really make visible that ecofeminism is no singular topic. It's a lot of topics. Uh, and also, make yeah, of course, we can't cover everything on one scorecard, but we've tried to cover some topics that uh, to us and our partners are this year important such as the gender just uh, energy transition, why should it be gender just, what does a just transition mean? Um, we focus on agriculture and specifically on, uh, for example, agroecology and the role of women farmers in, agri uh, in agriculture. We try to focus on inclusive decision making, which is also an important topic of today. Uh, for example, uh, through youth and diverse uh, decision making, uh, I mean, youth participation and inclusive decision making. Um, and lastly, uh, we try to do this from an intersectional perspective. Um, but we are also, as, as WCF, we are a learning uh, organization. Um, but we, uh, we are working on that, definitely. Next slide, please. And this is also an example of the tokens that we've done before. So a climate, token, a climate justice token for youth. Why do we need ecofeminism in the Green Deal? Because, the, of course, the Green Deal is also a big uh, topic this EU elections. And how to mobilize young feminists for climate justice. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. 
And then why are these elections so important? Because um, they are actually, that's that's already something I can tell you. Um, as I just briefly mentioned, and uh, my colleague Noor will uh, go a bit deeper into that, um, the European Green Deal is on the table um, and actually the future of this Green Deal, of all these climate and biodiversity policies are uh, really at stake in the upcoming year uh, slash years. Besides, it's a very important uh, moment to influence the strategic agenda, uh, of like four or five point agenda that will be um, yeah, determining the road the European Union is taking in the coming five years. And as you all might know, um, there's a lot of disinformation on climate and gender on more topics, but uh, I'm highlighting these two today. Um, it's going from climate denial to doomism to delayism. And I think it's also our job as ecofeminist movement to really keep stressing the urgency and the need of uh, ecofeminist movement building and the importance of uh, the integration of gender in policies, for example. And as also just mentioned, um, it's once again very important to really um, make this young or youth voice uh, being heard um, during the elections. So um, I hope we can uh, set the step in a good direction today. Um, yeah, and then uh, the big moment is there. Uh, we'll be going to the uh, scorecard and um, a little bit of context on that. Um, my colleague Noor has done some great work on that and she will be highlighting a bit of the methodology, um, what things stood out uh, during the analysis, uh, what's also like a little bit of context on how do these parties work, because I think that's also something that's still uh, quite underscored. Um, yeah, and afterwards we'll engage in discussion on the uh, on the different topics on the scorecard. So I will remove the spotlight for myself and uh, I'll give the floor to Noor. Yes, there she is. There I am. Thank you, Jana. Um, yeah, could we go to the next slide, uh, please? Yes, perfect. So the scorecard of 2024, um, thank you for the introduction. And um, as you said, I'm going to go a little bit through um, how we did it, how it works and uh, the things that we really uh, realized during the analysis. So most of um, why we do it has been covered by Jana already, but it's um, again to stress that the EU elections can be a very confusing space and a lot of um, and the EU in general can be a very confusing space. So we've decided to make this scorecard not only scoring national parties in all these different countries, but also make a scorecard that scores the EU groups. And that's to help, especially young people, since they are so important for this election, um, cut through the jargon, cut through the uh, political maze, so to say, and help them uh, in voting for... Um, groups and parties that actually represents ecofeminist values. So we've created a voting aid and one of them uh, we will presenting, be presenting today and that's this one on the EU parties. Could we go to the next slide? Yeah, and we did that because the EU has a system where you vote in your national country, you vote for your national party, um, just any party in your country, and they will then go to the parliament. But since there's over a, a 180 parties in that parliament and from 27 different countries, that would get very confusing. So in the EU parliament, it was decided that these uh, national parties group themselves based on ideology with national parties from other countries. So that would mean that a party from Germany and a party from Spain, um, they can all be together in one political group. And that ended up with seven political groups and one group for the non-affiliated. So those are the people that don't want to join one of these ideological groups. And how that works is you see them here on the screen. But so we have seven. Uh, we have the Greens. Um, we have uh, the Left. Uh, we have uh, SND. Renew. Uh, Renew is more of the Liberals. Uh, SD is the socialists. We have the Christian Democrats, the EPP, and then progressively we move to the ECR, which is the conservatives, and the ID, which is the more nationalist uh, grouping. And then the last one is the NE, which is the non affiliated. So basically, every national party will try to sort themselves into one of these ideological groups. And then they will, with this group, 
uh, take part in lobbying, they will uh, head commissions, they will do a large part of their discussions from this national group, from this political group. Um, so that being said, it's very important to not only read the political party program and not only look into the national party that you're going to vote for in your country, but also look at the group that they are a part of. Because if you're not part of a group, so you're part of the NE, um, the NE faction, so to say, um, you have significantly less power in the European Parliament. So it's in the benefit of any of the national parties that will vote for to be in one of these ideological groups. So uh, to have that lobbying power, to have that political um, kind of momentum. So they'll often bend themselves to fit a little bit better within that group. So it's really important to know what that group thinks and wants. And some groups such as the APP, um, which is the Christian Democrats, they even have party discipline, which means that they all will vote the same. That's not true for every uh, single group, but for them it is. Um, so for them, it's extra important to know what that group thinks aside from your national party. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yes. So in our ecofeminist scorecard, you already mentioned that we focus on a just energy transition, but in total, we focus on these six topics. So we have just energy transition, make polluters pay, say no to toxic chemicals, youth at the decision table, agriculture and fair trade. And in each of these topics, we looked um, not only on our parties or our groups furthering uh, agendas that would contribute to this topic in a transformative way, but are they also uh, inclusive in their way of making these plans? And do they take into account ex any extra or additional effects that their, their measures might have uh, in the future? So we've really taken their plans in kind of a holistic way looking from all sides whether the plan would contribute positively um, to EU policy. These six, um, these six topics we've scored for each of the groups. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, and we've scored them based on a stoplight system. So basically we've said, okay, you know, if, a, if there is a good, strong plan, which is also transformative and... Um, inclusive in nature, we've given them a green vote. If there was some mention of key words and some mention of a plan, but it wasn't transformative in nature, we've given them uh, yellow, uh, or if they only touched upon some parts of that topic. And if they had no plans or plans that would actually set us back, we gave them red. Now, this can be a bit up in the air um, on how you vote regarding these things. So we've made a code book this time, and we've said that each of these six topics, we've given 25 points uh, to different key words, key topics within that bigger, um, bigger umbrella of a topic. And we've said, okay, if they don't mention these, they don't get the points. So in the end, there is a very comprehensive code book, which you can also find on our website. Um, it's been published yesterday or today, and it will be with the scorecard, and you can see exactly why we scored certain parties and groups in certain ways. So for example, in uh, the toxic, say no to toxic chemicals topic, we've said if you don't mention PFAS, or if you don't mention um, we've also talked about menstruation and toxics, toxins in menstru menstrual products. And if you don't mention that, you automatically get some points reduced. Uh, the same goes for the Green Deal. If it wasn't mentioned, automatically reduce some points. Even though some party programs might be really comprehensive and we might trust that they will vote in favor of these things, if they didn't mention it in their plan, we didn't give them the points in this time. Um, yeah, we can go to the next slide. Because I will highlight some things that we found. So as I said before, we really scored based on a code book. And we said, if you don't mention it, you don't get the point. Um, you can see that, for example, for SND in regards to just energy transition, that gives them a red score because they didn't mention them. Now, having read the program, I think they might be in favor of a just energy transition, but they didn't mention it in their plan. So that all comes to my next point, which is this is a great voting aid. It's a great place to start, but we would encourage you to always also look into the groups themselves and look into the way they communicate to their voters. Um, because this is, voting aid is 
purely based on the party manifestos and the group plans they wrote. Uh, it's not based on their further ideology because we wanted to keep it as objective as possible whilst still looking at the ecofeminist agenda. Overall, it was a really fun project to do and it really um, stood out that these group, especially these EU group programs are very broad, which also makes it uh, more difficult to comb through them and see, hey, what do they actually mean? Because all of them mention climate and all of them mention uh, pollution, but some don't really um, go into it as deeply or go into it with actual concrete plans. Um, something else to mention whilst we see a scorecard, I know that you're already seeing the blue dots on the side. At the time of scoring the group plans for these two groups weren't available yet so we haven't read them but um, now they are they have been put online since and since the code book is also on our website we do really encourage you to read the plan have the code book next to it and determine for yourself like hey what kind of code would it give it would i give it and uh, really go through whether they are transformative in nature whether they are inclusive in nature um, and you can kind of finish our scorecard, but this would be a first step. The last thing uh, to say is that I would really encourage everybody, even though uh, this is a first step, but I would really encourage everybody to uh, pay attention to these groups when voting, because as I said before, uh, they do hold a lot of power and they will try to bend your national parties to their will, uh, and they have a lot of power in doing so. So. In the end, when you're voting, please pay attention to the actual plans of the group that your party is a part of, um, rather than just your party, because they might be a very small player in a very big group. Uh, and then they will vote for things that you might not agree, to, uh, agree with. Thanks a lot, um, Noor. Um, that was really insightful. Um, and also, indeed, what you're saying, uh, please, be, we have a disclaimer on our scorecard uh, uh, that please uh, uh, look at this uh, scorecard also hand in hand with the national scorecard to get a, uh, an image that is as complete as possible. Um, and also, um, I also saw the question in the chat um, that uh, all the party manifestos are available on our website um, to make it also a little bit more accessible for people. Because as we said, we know it's quite a labyrinth or a maze in, uh, to find your way through the European Union. Uh, and this is really like a guide. Um, but I know, for example, um, like uh, Can International Climate Action Network also has a voting guide that then is looking, for example, at the voting behavior of, of the last, uh, I don't know, X, X, X month. So, um, and I think, in, in all with all of these uh, uh, voting guides, we should try to complement each other. And I see a hand, I think, from Devika. Oh, no, that's not true. That was my own mouse. Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, perfect. Thank you, Noor. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them in the chat while we're doing the presentation. But I see we're a little bit behind uh, scheme, so we will go, um, we will continue now. And then first, still with one question, and that is, what theme do you think is most important on the scorecard? And that will go a little bit further. So uh, that's this one. And I'm quite curious to, to know uh, in our audience, uh, what is the theme that speaks to you the most? What do you think that these elections are most important? It can also be that they're not in here. If you think there's something missing, please, uh, drop it in the chat, um, but just to know uh, what people think is important. I see the gender just energy transition. Yeah, chemicals. Chemicals is such an under underscore topic. Um, Especially, I think it's it's really great, of course, that we have a, a very big climate justice focus, but this climate justice focus should also, of course, include a uh, focus on environment and pollution and the gendered impacts of these uh, polluting chemicals. Um, in the scorecard, that's why uh, Noor also just, for example, mentioned menstruation, uh, that we specifically look at what is the impact uh, of pesticides on our menstruation products, how do these uh, pesticides end up in our bodies when making use of menstruation products? So that's also a specific focus that we that we try to have. Um, make polluters pay. Yeah, okay. 
is the decision making table is quite low, but also diverse decision making is still very important. Okay, good. It's a uh, it's a nice uh, stairs if I look at it like this. Okay, and then uh, we'll go further to our panel discussion, and I'm going to spotlight the people that will be there. Uh... Oh. Oh. No, this doesn't work. Mm. Mm. Oh, I can't spotlight the four of us, I think. Oh, spotlight. Yeah, okay. There it is. Tuvuga and then about. There we are, the four of us in a. Nice cozy panel. <laughs> um, great that you're all here. I uh, will surely introduce all of you. Um, so uh, today we're here uh, with uh, Tifika Partiman from Stem Up and Vrouw, as I said, both for a woman, um, Francesca Sabatini, a political activist and researcher from the University of Bologna, and Ewat van Hoek, uh, number 26 on the list for Party of the Animals. And with his 19 years, it's a, it's a nice tagline. <laughs> uh the youngest in the netherlands to vote for um super great that you can all uh, be here and uh, very happy to discuss the scorecards and also uh, in the upcoming eu elections with you and i'm just gonna start with the question of what do you think that stood out most of, of the scorecards uh for for each of you because i'm quite curious why do you think it's important to have these voting guides um were there any surprises you had uh, seeing this Maybe going to the Vika. Hey, nice to meet you all. Um, and thanks for the invite. So the scorecard. I think I still I need to dive in a little bit because I didn't specifically look at like what party says what. I just looked at the at the whole thing. Um, what I do really applaud is the fact that you took the political groups into account. And what I didn't know is that there's a difference in faction discipline so that in one political group, everybody has to vote the same and in others they don't. So mm -hmm. I didn't know that. That was a, that was a good lesson. Mm -hmm. How was that for the rest? I think it's very important to have this um, scorecard because a lot of people don't know uh, everything about the political groups in the European parliament. Um, and it is even very important to look at the national uh, parties as well. Um, but it's very important. But I guess it's also important to look at the uh, political groups in the European Parliament and the uh, Fraxi discipline. Oh. Oh. oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I thought I'd see you, but you're still there. No, I... uh, definitely. All right. No, I think it's also important for people to know what is out there in terms of programs, because they hear a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of vagueness in the news and in um, like in normal like media communication, like uh, people often vote very emotionally based on a very generic understanding of what politics is, what it does at the European level, and what the aspects of a political campaign uh, actually include in terms of, like, not of ge just gender equality and climate change, but uh, social justice uh, and uh, um, anything that, like, goes in the direction of making people actually aware is like should be welcomed with joy, I think. So that was my and like my main point when I saw the scorecard. It's so important pe that people know that like how you know um a political program is structured and who contributes to what that is relevant for them because there's also a lot of uh, um disbelief and uh, a lot of discouragement of young people so like they don't even know that there are people that are talking about the topics that are relevant to them so it's not just uh, like you should know who is not doing enough but you should also know that there are people that are doing something and what are the margin of improvements for those that don't have uh, that have something but it's not enough to them so that was my main point when i read this mm -hmm. and and why do why do you think that is that we don't have uh that it's so inaccessible or that youth are actively discouraged to to engage in voting for the U European Union? I think that they're like, 
that I, there, there's a huge knowledge gap in the sense that information is uh, is channeled through. Um, once again, like there is an emotional problem that is related to the way that people attach their values to some very generic um, ideas in the first place. And this happens at, at all levels and uh, in every um, like in, in every direction, either in the uh, in the far right, in the far left. But also also I think that the like the journalists and people who disseminate information have a huge responsibility in that like we are missing. Um, like clear, understandable, and and transparent, uh, and accountable information um, most often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that's also um, indeed what 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 we try to do is that, of course, we are here also with our own eco-feminist agenda. So, in that sense, I will never claim that we are uh, fully objective, but uh, indeed in that there is a way or to make this information accessible and uh, also. That it's easy to be to be found even, uh, um, and not having to browse uh, through all of the internet in order to find the uh, party manifesto, for example. Mm, then I'll go uh, specifically maybe to to Ewout as the one of the youngest here, because uh, youth participation is, is of course a very important topic on the scorecard, and what we've also saw seen is that uh, political groups or political parties really seem to lag behind on this topic like they they don't really pay attention to it or they yeah they, they don't have a profound focus uh what do you believe then that there are obstacles here for more inclusive decision making in the eu um yeah the average age of the, the of a member of the european parliament is around uh, 50 years old uh so that's uh, very old um but i it depends on uh the local the national parties because they make the lists for the um for the uh, elections but i think um it is for a lot of people for young people it feels like the european parliament is uh far away for them um but it's but actual, it's everywhere. The European Union, uh, it has to be a hot topic at the moment, uh, especially for young people, because it's our future. Um, and there are a lot of uh, things uh, like the Green Deal um, and other topics uh, who are very, which are very important for the younger people here. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. does that answer uh, the question? Definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what what do you think of that, Vika and Francesca? I go. Okay. Well, there is. Um, it it's a very challenging question. I mean, it's. Uh, I I think it's very hard. Like right now, we're having like difficulties even in engaging young people in voting. Uh, so even like making them, you know, access the parliament uh, is a dream. Like I'm, I'm very happy that Evote is here actually and uh, and campaigning this. But uh, I I think that we are once again at a, at a zero level that we need to uh, activate first. So we need a lot more of uh, like uh, political and civil education in schools, for example, to actually raise awareness uh, about the values on which the European Union was funded, uh, founded and the uh, and the uh, um like the the weight and the importance that it has today on on the the politics uh, even at the national even at the national level. So um I think that if, if like it's not just information, it's also education. We need like we need this political culture to actually permeate uh, the environment that we live in before thinking of uh, uh, of creating like higher levels of awareness. Uh, I think. Mm -hmm. mm, and could you maybe tell a little bit more about your background then as an activist? Like, how uh, are you trying to connect this EU participation towards the activist level or grassroots? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, like, to say very, like, very few words about my activism. I work with political collectives in Bologna, um, especially um, regarding housing rights and rights to healthcare. So, we've been uh, working a lot, both in practices and in politics, um, to uh, make people actually access uh, um, healthcare and and uh, receiving 
basic healthcare uh, through the work of, of volunteers in the popular healthcare lab that was established in um, in a space that was given by the municipality. Um, and also working a lot um, in advocating for housing rights, especially of homeless people, um, as, and especially um, through political pressure, we were actually able to open the like to to have the municipality open the first uh, twenty four hours dormitory in the city, which makes a huge difference for people not knowing um, where to go or where to leave their stuff if they have to search for a job, for example, like you cannot bring your own stuff um, with you if you are to apply for uh, for a job, for example. So um, we uh, like there's a lot of what, what you do and and this connects also to the importance of uh, uh, of, uh, of voting on the other hand what what you do with activism at least at the grassroots level is basically building counter narratives to what like political institutions at every level are saying and what and what they're doing so you're signaling basically like you're you're creating the evidence that most things are aren't actually working um, and you give voice to people who wouldn't normally have it. And so like uh, rather than having, for example, um, social workers say what homeless people say, you ask directly to homeless people. So you're building a counter narrative and you're also prototyping models for how this can be done in a different mm -hmm. uh, in a different way. You cannot substitute and you do not want to substitute yourself to the welfare state that is the main point and this gets me to the uh, um, to the matter of the uh, EU level and of national voting um, you can only prototype once again you can signal and prototype uh, um, the gaps in in a welfare state but uh, it, until our political systems are based on voting and are based on um, elective uh, systems, um, this is the most powerful tool that we have to uh, change um, infrastructurally the system in which we live uh, and not just uh, in, in a spotted and uh, unsystematic way. So uh, I'm not saying that the work that like the political activists do at the grassroots level is unsystematic. It's already huge, but of course uh, it it cannot reach um, the same infrastructural level that uh, a political party can at both the European and the national level. Mm -hmm. No, very powerful. I hope it's for that. Yeah, I hope it wasn't too long. Sorry. No, 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 definitely not. No, really interesting, because I I do think there's uh, there's definitely some truth in that. And I was what I was thinking is that I heard you talking about, for example, prototypes, and I wanted to connect that to uh, what Devika is doing with also creating new maybe role models with votes for a woman or some of a vrouw. Could you maybe uh, elaborate also a bit on that? Yeah, of course. Um, so at Vote for a Woman, Stem op een Vrouw, uh, we started in 2017 as what we thought was going to be a one-time voting campaign calling on voters in the Netherlands to vote strategically for women. Um, in the Netherlands, I mean, we do have a multi-party democracy, uh, but you vote for a candidate. So you pick one candidate and make that box red, uh, like in many other countries, and that means you can vote um, for a preferential candidate. So you can choose which candidate you pick. Um, and even though you can, most people automatically, when they vote for women, vote for the highest woman on the candidate list, just automatically. And we have been trying to tell them that it's way more strategic to uh, vote for a woman who is a little bit lower on the list. Um, because then when somebody like is at a risk of falling out, you can help them basically vote them up and, and still become elected and in that way, you vote extra women in politics. Um, that's still one of our most visible um, types of work. And this, of course, works for many other demographic groups as well. So if you want to elect AWOT or, you know, young people in general in the European Parliament, then from the Netherlands, at least you can use a preferential vote. And well, you do have to trust that enough people are going to do it. Um, but for us, it's been really effective. Uh, in the past few years, we've gotten over uh, 600 extra women elected uh, via this tactic from all different kinds of political levels. Um, and besides that, we do all kinds of other things like mentorship and research and training. Um, but getting back to the role model parts, uh, Jana, that you asked about, um, I think one of the most fundamental reasons people don't vote, um, besides obviously it is completely 
it's very hard to follow politics. It's very hard to follow European politics. So there's a lot to unpack there. But another big reason is a uh, lack of political trust. And we know from a lot of scientific research about what builds political trust is uh, representation is a really big part of that. And um, representation in this research specifically means people that literally look like you. You have something in common with that can be uh, age, it can be ethnicity, it can be gender, uh, it can be whether you're queer or not. Um, but these types of visible representation uh, automatically create a bigger trust in politics. So when you have those role models and there's you know, just not one of them fighting against a lot of online hate, but there's a group of them and you can see that it's normal within multiple uh, democratic parties, then that really helps build trust in politics because, well, you see that you can become active as well. You see that people who look like you, you look like you, think like you, get an opportunity to be a part of it. And for us, that's why, well, mainly that's one of the reasons that we're doing our work and getting more women active is that we want to get people involved in politics and specifically women and girls. Um, because when we look at, for example, who is a member of a political party, when we look at who votes, when we look at all kinds of different things who is represented when it comes to actual policy, um, then women, and especially when you dissect the group of women and look at women of color, uh, queer women, et cetera, young women, et cetera, et cetera, they are very badly represented in basically each type of way. Yeah, no, I have to say I'm uh, really impressed by, uh, I've been following Sam Bevrouw for some time, uh, and uh, I think I saw this week uh, an article, an article in the Dutch newspaper about that we now have to vo uh, vote quite that all the fac faction leaders are men now. Uh, so that uh, that would yeah, which is a pity. Um, but that you automatically cannot vote then for the for the first yeah the the leader of the list so to say. And I also wanted to again make a bridge because I know that Ewout you told me also that there is something similar for vote for a young person, right? Uh, that there are similar collectives. Yeah, there is something like vote for uh, stem op een jongere, vote for a younger uh, person in the Netherlands. And I think, uh, Divika, you know something about it, but there is something uh, but then for younger people um, on the list, yes. Um, and what also interesting is, is that uh, in the European Parliament elections in the Netherlands, we have only two uh, party leaders for the uh, uh, European Parliament who are a woman. Uh, so the rest is all of the rest of the party leaders for the European Parliament uh, elections are men. Uh, so that's very sad. Yeah, yeah and no. I think even for men, and Eva, I'm sure you can uh, recognize yourself in this. Also, the group of men, yes, men are very well represented when it comes to party leader leaders, but again, which men? So most of them are white, most of them are quite old, most of them have done like one or multiple academic studies. They're, they share similar backgrounds, so there's also like which men are represented. I think men and, and boys are missing a lot of diverse role models as well. And now I'm not even taking into account that non-binary people are like nowhere to be found in the European Parliament, literally. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that having said, that leaves us quite uh, the challenge still. And I hope this also motivates people to, and I think like, again, then uh, having a higher voter turnout, uh, because there are also quite some progressive people not voting, but that high, higher voter turnout would already result in a, more diverse uh, representation in the European Parliament, for example, uh, making it even more important to uh, to be engaged. Um, but thank you for that. I think it's all uh, three very different perspectives, but all actually it comes down also on the same on representation, all have on having these role models, and on maybe facilitating also this this political participation a bit more. Um, we don't have like a lot of time left, but I do. I would like to ask one. Uh, more question and that it's still a bit about also the, the rights that are under pressure at this moment um, 
And I think I already heard uh, some talking about the uh, formation of counter narratives, but what do you think is then the most important maybe exercise for us as uh, eco-feminist movement in response to all of these vices that are under pressure? How can we, how can we counter that? Uh, I'll start off. <laughs> I think um, with, with Vote for a Woman, we're asking ourselves the same question in a way, like what is our, how can we tell people why it's important to vote? How can we motivate them? What should we do? And I think, well, especially from the perspective of the Netherlands, Europe has been quite a driving force for progressive change when it comes to gender equality. Um, the Netherlands has this, you know, international reputation, or at least they're trying to keep on <laughs> high of being like very gender equal and finding that really important. And um, but when you look at like the milestones that we've reached in the Netherlands in regards to gender equality, most of them from the recent decades are uh, via a push through the European Parliament and. So I think it's really important to show what has been affected in the past. For example, parental leave has, of course, via the European Parliament, um, been upped uh, to six days for all European Union countries. Uh, for most countries, that wasn't an up because most countries have more than six days parental leave, luckily. But in the Netherlands, for example, there were only two days parental leave. Um, and so now we have six, thanks to the European Parliament. And it's things like that, I think that people really need to know, like it's good for gender equality, it forces even countries like the Netherlands to make progressive steps, which is also the danger of the rise of the far right and the extreme right, of course, now that Europe is not gonna be a progressive change, it's gonna be a conservative change. Um, so that like doom scenario, I think we also have to talk about. I think it's very much also related to the arenas that we're occupying because I think that like right here, even like though of course all these are very noble um, exercises where we all, you know, um, discuss with each other about what is to be done, that the matter is about exiting in the public sphere as much as possible in public spaces and trying to dialogue with people who believe very different things than we do, um, which is something that is hard to do. I know, like it, it can be, um, it can be very controversial. It can be conf confrontational, but at the same time, we do need to occupy new spaces uh, for this to, for this to happen. So, in order for, um, to, like to be able to actually advocate for these needs, we we need to go to the unaware and we need to go to the people that. Uh, believe very different things uh, because once again there is misinformation so we don't know at the moment uh, like in, in in italy like the right to abo abortion is like dramatic dramatically under threat like a lot of people don't even know like a lot of students do not know that they have the right to vote outside of their um town of residency so they do not even apply to do that and of course this results in like Young younger voter turnout to be very small in Italy because of course only people who vote in the uh, in the place where they reside are actually able to vote, which are most likely to be um, older people. So there, like, there is a lot of dissemination to be done, uh, um, but in like the most diverse arenas of discourse, I think. Yes, and it's very important to um, know that a lot of laws will start in the European uh, Union. Uh, so we can, um, a lot of things we can do, um, a lot of um, global issues we can start uh, with the, within the uh, European Parliament, within the European Union, and we can, um, a lot of like uh, abortion, uh, there's a lot of, uh, um, there are a lot of uh, things which are very uh, important um, to have uh, to, to have the rights for human rights to have uh, those things, um, but we can take it from a higher level, and that's the European uh, Parliament and the European Union. And it's so important to um, to uh, to vote for the European Parliament elections because almost every law will start in the European Union. 
Thank you. I think that's a that's a good way uh, to close this panel discussion uh, and a good um, encouragement for everyone to to stay engaged in that sense. Thanks a lot, uh, Rivika, Francesca, and Ewout for this discussion. I found it's really interesting. Actually, I had a lot more questions, but um, I'll leave that for another time. Wait, I'm going to uh, stop the spotlight. Um, and Yasha, could you share the presentation again? Because we, then we'll go to the uh, last steps of this meeting. So. Next slide, please. Yeah, if you have questions, you can still post them in the chat. Next slide. Next. <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, the previous one. Um, because uh, now we've given you all this information and said uh, a lot of times that it's really important to vote, uh, but also um, we still have a month of campaigning and that's uh, why, we, as I said, we have this meeting today. Uh, check out our website. Um, on our website, we have a very beautiful page, which is uh, all on the scorecards. Uh, and it sets out these scores, explains, uh, it gives a detailed score per category. So what are the specific categories or like specific subsections that we focus on within these scores? Uh, what are the keywords to focus on? Uh, which EU groups and which parties are there? And uh, how are the manifestos available? Um, so um, as I said, um, we also invite you to uh, make use of uh, the, of this material and also organize yourself. So go along with your friends, start uh, maybe on a, a gloomy sunny, Sunday afternoon and read up in the, uh, in the EU uh, manifestos and do an effort to actually score them um, because I think uh, this knowledge is super, super important. And also the toolkits are available on our website. As I said, they are there in multiple languages. I saw that uh, my colleague Chantal also said they will be there in French as well very soon. Um, so that's something uh, you can find all through this um, QR code. Next slide, please. And then I also uh, warmly uh, invite you to our next sessions because this is not the solitary session. Uh, we will be organizing um, specific thematic sessions on all the topics that are covered on the scorecard. So next week, that means that we will be talking specifically about youth participation and the gender just energy transition uh, with two of our uh, colleagues, um, uh, Valerie and Valeria. Valeria is uh, part of the energy team and Valerie has a lot of experience with um, citizen assemblies, a very direct form of um, yeah, of democracy. Um, the week after, we'll be talking about uh, something that is, as we included today, very important, agriculture and as artists chemicals, um, with some people of Pesticide Action Network, but also with our German colleagues. And they will be presenting there the, the specific German scorecard. And then the last uh, meeting on the 30th of May, uh, which is really one week before the EU elections, we'll be talking about the fair trade and about the polluter base principle. Um, and also these sessions are really meant to, if you know people, friends that are interested and want to know more about, okay, what does the EU actually do and what does it do for me, uh, then please attend our sessions, sign up via the website uh, and uh, stay engaged. Um, and then I have one last question and that is, oh, will you be using the scorecards? Are you sharing it with your friends? Um, are you already planning the campaign? Um, how are you going to make it visible? That's something for you to think about maybe in the next week. Um, but uh, I really hope that uh, that you can make use of this tool. Um, and it's also fine if you don't. <laughs> maybe you already know a lot about the EU election. That's also completely fine. But um, yeah, please check out the website um, and uh, also reach out to me if you have questions or things you would like to know more or if you would like to have help uh, in the uh, planning of the campaign. Um, I think I have my... Uh, oh, where's the, if you can share that presentation one more time, yeah, sure. 
I think I have my email address somewhere. If not, I will also follow up with all of you with an email where all the materials are uh, in one place. Oh, and then we have come, I think, to the next slide. We have come to the ending of this meeting. Uh, so please stay in touch, check out uh, the scorecard, and I hope to see many of you uh, very soon. Yeah. Okay. And have a great day. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great Thank day. you. Thanks for all. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Oh, and many thanks to the speakers, of course. Sorry. <laughs> I almost <laughs> forgot. <laughs> yeah, many thanks. Thanks to you. It was great to Thank meet you. you. Bye.